Uh, Today, we are um, ending our sermon series on courageous faith. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Exodus 3 and Exodus chapter 4, and you can turn there with us. If this is your first time here, I'd like to say welcome to Southern Christian Church. Welcome to our family. My name is Rick, and I typically preach here on Sunday mornings, uh, and so you'll be stuck with me if you continue to come back. But uh, I'm really glad that you're here, and I personally, and I know we as a church, would love to get to know you a little bit better. And so there's a connection card on the chair in front of you. If you'll take a few moments to fill that out and take it to our welcome center after service, um, we have a gift that we'll give you as our way of saying thanks for being here. And for every connection card that we get, we are going to make a charitable contribution at the end of the year to an organization called the Samaritan Women. The Samaritan Women, they're a local organization that fights back against human trafficking in our area. They have a house in Baltimore, and they utilize this property and their funds in this house to help restore women who have been trafficked um, by sexual predators. And so they have a tremendous work. And one of the reasons why we did Fall Fest yesterday was to raise awareness about the Samaritan Women. And so they had a table that was set up with a representative, and I hope you were able to connect with her. But uh, what an important ministry that is. So it's a double bonus. You get a gift, then we're also going to bless a local organization back um, in our area. So fill that out, take it to our Welcome Center after service, um, and we'll be able to connect with you later. But we're going to end our sermon today um, with the idea of commission. Last week, if you remember, when we looked at the story of Moses, Moses, God wanted Moses, Moses to get to a point where he had a confident certainty beyond a reasonable doubt that God exists And God has a plan for us, and he wants a relationship with us. And we talked about how you really can't know anything for certain other than like logical certainty or mathematical certainty. In this life, most information that we get and that we have is what's called inductive reasoning, inductive information. We gather up all the material that we're able to have access to, and then we create a conclusion that's on probability. And so I can say beyond a reasonable doubt um, that I was born of a woman and that I have a mother. Am I going to be able to know that absolutely for certain? No. But logic and reason and probability gives me a good reason to believe that my mom's name is Rhonda and she gave birth to me. And that's the same way it is with faith. And even a lot of scientific uh, principles that we learn, a lot of scientific information, they gather up all the information that we have access to and they render a conclusion that gives us almost absolute certainty. Well, it's really no different with faith. Faith is not an outlier. We look at all the information that we have in this universe And then we render our conclusion. And so if we are going to be a people of faith, God wants us to be a people that has reasonable certainty, beyond a reasonable doubt. And so that's why I'm a Christian, is because I look at the evidence and I render my conclusion. God exists. Jesus resurrected from the dead. The Bible is true. And I want to live my life for him. Well, the week before that, we looked at character. And we said, courage without character is really careless Christianity. And so what's the point of having confident certainty that God exists if we're lacking in moral character? And Moses, at one point in his life, was lacking in moral character. And then finally, the week before that, we looked at courage. We looked at how the Hebrew women who were ordered by Pharaoh to murder all the newborn sons that were born to the Hebrews, they disobeyed that, they stepped out with courageous faith, and they chose to fear God rather than Pharaoh. And so God is calling us to have courage with character and conviction that we know that God exists and he resurrected from the dead. But what's the point of having courage and character and conviction if we never share the commission with other people? And so here we're going to look at Moses. He's going to be commissioned by God to share a message, not just with the people of Israel, the Hebrews, but also with Pharaoh and the Egyptians. You know, I've been sent out on some very important uh, trips before. I've gone to mission trips, and some of the most important trips that I've ever taken in my life is when my wife sends me to the grocery store. Now, I have tried and tried and tried to get it right to the point where I finally just gave up and tried to get it wrong so I wouldn't have to go anymore. (laughs) And that's not right. But there was one specific time when I had one of the most glorious experiences that a husband can ever have. My wife sent me to Costco to pick up some very important items, one of the most important items that she had on this list 
that I locked in here because my mind is a steel trap were photos and pictures that she actually really needed. And so I go out to Costco on a Saturday morning uh, and I get there. And have you ever gotten distracted before when you go grocery shopping, especially at Costco? Like now as an adult, Angel and I fight over who gets to go to Costco alone without the kids. And so grocery shopping is a wonderful thing now. I actually want to go. It's amazing how life really changes. Anyways, I know, I'm such a loser. I love to go to Costco. It's so much fun. Regardless, so I go to Costco and I'm picking up some very important items and I get distracted. And so I get nothing that Angel told me to get at Costco. And I come home and I'm marching through the door and I have a big grin on my face because what I got distracted with was pancake mix and syrup, if you've ever gone to Costco. And so I'm like, hey, honey, check it out. Look what I got. And she's like, did you get my stuff? And I'm like, uh-oh, I forgot. <laughs> I had to go back out to Costco to get the very things that she told me to get in the first place. It's terrible. But I love pancakes and syrup. It's one of my favorite things to eat. And obviously, that served priority over the things that my wife asked me to get her. Have you ever been sent out on an important mission and you totally epically failed or you didn't want to go in the first place? That's exactly what's going on with Moses. You know, if you actually look up statistics on this, um, one of the most famous organizations in Christianity, it's called Barna Research Group. And what they do is they research certain things in Christianity to give the church a better, a better understanding of what's going on in our culture. And 20 years ago, almost 98% of Christians believed sharing and being commissioned by Christ was absolutely necessary for their faith. 20 years later, today, Almost half of millennials alone believe that evangelizing and sharing their faith is morally wrong. I mean, think about that. It's actually wrong to impose your beliefs or to share the gospel with the people around you. I mean, that's kind of a scary statistic. That something is changing in our culture where we believe that Jesus is necessary, where we believe that we should have courage and character and conviction but we shouldn't share that with anyone else. And I think there's some reasons why, not just because of our culture, but I think there's some genuine reasons why we, as Christians, are hesitant to share our faith with other people. And I think when we look at the story of Moses, we are going to identify and see some of those same reasons in ourselves. If you look at Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 10, read a few verses that we read last week just to kind of pair it together. God has presented himself to Moses in the form of a burning bush. And this is what we call a theophany, uh, a pre-incarnate view of God. And he chose to take on the form of this burning bush. And so he presents himself before Moses, who is now a shepherd, out in the desert, 80 years old, 40 years after being in Egypt. And Moses is caught off guard by the presence of God. He is in fear. He is afraid. After all, if you saw a burning bush, would that not give you reason to be scared? <laughs> and then a voice comes out of that burning bush, and you're probably thinking, I'm going morally insane. I'm going mentally insane. What's happening to me? And so here is Moses speaking to God. He's not going insane. This is actually God at work. And it says in verse 10 that God says to Moses, Therefore come now, I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, look at Moses' response. Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? You see, Moses knew about the providence and the plan of God all along. He heard it from his biological mother, that he was a Hebrew and that he was a part of God's chosen people to bring about a greater purpose. And here he stands, 80 years old, okay, so he's not in the prime time of his life. He's been out of Egypt for 40 years because he murdered a man. And he's been on the run, and he's been a shepherd. And for the last 40 years, he's really kind of felt like a nobody. And if you remember from last week, God said, you're finally ready. Now, here's the first issue that Moses has with being commissioned by God that maybe you and I struggle with the same thing as well. Are we really worthy to be sent out by God? I mean, after all, don't we have this conception that people that are sent out by God are the, are the people who know everything there is to know about the Bible? Are the people who are the of greatest moral character, people in positions of power and influence like Kanye West? Look, I think this is awesome that Kanye West, his eyes have been opened to what has been going on in culture for him and for his life. I mean, he's actually asked people on staff not to have premarital sex. I mean, can you think about this? Somebody that's actually a music artist that's successful has now 
undergone the process of conversion, is giving his life to the Lord, and he comes out with an album, Jesus is King. I mean, to me, that's awesome to see the providence of God at work. And isn't that the kind of people that God wants? People who have a lot of money, a lot of influence, a lot of power? Or is it the shepherds, the nobodies, the people who look at themselves and say, I can't possibly be commissioned by God to do anything great with my life. But notice what God says in verse 12. You see, Moses is lacking confidence. And last week, if we're people of faith, we should have confidence in what we believe and what we know. And Moses lacked confidence in himself. And look what God said to Moses. And he said, certainly, Moses, look at this. I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people up out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Moses, you might not have it all together. You might not have the knowledge. You might not have the skill or the power, the prestige, the money. But guess what? You're ready. And I'm going to be with you. And you know, God promised to be with Moses. And guess what? You might feel like you yourself are inadequate to share the gospel with other people. But God has given Moses a promise, and God gives us a promise that he is with us. He is on your side. In fact, Paul put it like this in the book of Romans chapter 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? God, who am I that I should stand up to the pharaohs of this world, that I should proclaim your truth with your people? And God says, I am with you. I am for you. I am on your side. A lot of us struggle with this today. You know, this wasn't foreign to the apostles either. The apostles were unlearned men. They weren't skilled in uh, the ways of logic and reasoning. They, many of them didn't even know how to read and write. But God took these unlearned men and he made them something great. Paul had a little bit to say about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, not that we, speaking of the apostles, are competent in ourselves to claim that anything comes from us. In other words, he's saying, look, it's not us. It's not me. Now, Paul was the most skilled apostle out of the entire group, arguably. I mean, the guy was trained in logic. He was trained in the Old Testament scriptures. He had great moral character. If there was anybody that you wanted to lead your people, it would be Paul. The only problem is he was zealous for God, but in all the wrong ways. And so he ended up hunting Christians down and murdering them. But God converted this man and changed him into a great tool and a great vessel for the Lord. But he says, look, it's not us that comes Uh, this idea or this truth or this miraculous work. It is God. He says our competence comes from God, and he has qualified us as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. You know, when you have asked the question, God, who am I? God says you're ready. When you actually have the right view of yourselves, you're ready to share the gospel. You know, when Peter actually went out and he preached uh, to the very people that were the leaders of his day, he couldn't stop preaching the gospel. They actually threatened to imprison him. They locked him up. They wanted to kill him. But he says, look, I, I cannot stop preaching the gospel. These guys were unlearned, untrained. In fact, Peter couldn't write. And so he had a scribe that wrote First and Second Peter for him um, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And look at what Peter has to say in Acts chapter 4. And look what the Bible says about, about Peter. It says, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they marveled and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. There's something amazing about God taking ordinary people and doing extraordinary things. Fishermen. These guys were fishermen. Unlearned people. And you know what? If you doubt yourself whether or not you're qualified to be a person that carries out God's commission— That's what makes you qualified. That's what makes God want to use you. And guess what? When you are commissioned by God, the Bible promises that God's presence is with you. He is on your side. When Jesus sent out his apostles in Matthew chapter 28, this is what the Bible says. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Who am I, God? God says, look, I'm with you. And I want you to go. And I want you to share the message with the people in your part of the world. Well, look at what also Moses has to say. He says, first of all, who am I? Second of all, what in the world am I going to say? 
You know what's interesting? When I looked at the research that Barna did, while 40% of millennials, almost half of millennials thought that sharing their faith was morally wrong, 73% of them felt confident in the ability to share their faith. That's really good news. The problem in our culture may not necessarily be knowledge. The problem may be what's going on here. What in the world should I say because I don't want to offend anybody? Have you ever been stuck in a position like that? You know, Angel sometimes... She'll come up and ask me, what do you love about me? It's a trick question. (laughs) It's a trap. And I'm like, "Uh, you're beautiful. Oh, come on. There's got to be more than that. And then so I'll pull out my list that I've written down on my phone. I'll say, hey, look, let's go through this right now, okay? There are so many things that I love about my wife. But husbands, you ever been caught off guard with a question like that? You're like, something deeper is going on here. What are you trying to do to me? And so here's Moses. He's asking God. He's like, God, what in the world am I going to say? I mean, I've been out of Egypt for 40 years. I've been a shepherd. I'm a, I'm a nobody. I haven't heard these stories about you um, or about God, you know, since the time that I left my mother's household. Um, but thankfully, God did provide a way for Moses to learn about who he was um, with his father-in-law, Jethro, who was a priest, and I believe was a priest of God. But uh, that's up for debate. Anyway, so here we have in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, look, people know what to say generally. It's just how to say it. And it says in verse 13, then Moses said to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, well, what's his name? What in the world shall I say to them? Hey, uh, Hebrews, I was out in the desert a few months ago and I saw a bush that was on fire, but it didn't burn up. (laughs) And a voice came out of it that told me to come rescue you out of Egypt. Are you going to believe that? No, (laughs) I'm not believing it. I'm like, look, this guy is nuts. A burning bush is talking to him and he wants me to follow him out of Egypt into the desert. No, thank you. And so Moses, this is a good thing. What am I supposed to say? And so here he comes up with this excuse. He's been out of Egypt for 40 years. And look, the Hebrews have been in Egypt for 400 years. And a guy that's seen a burning bush with a voice coming out of it is the one to lead them out of Egypt. Not going to happen. But God says, look, this is what I want you to say in verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus shall you say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name to all generations. The God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to rescue you. And that should carry a lot of weight. Look, if people don't come in the the name of the Lord, you really ought to question well, what authority are you coming in? Look, if people don't come with God's word, with his authority, we should really ask the question, well, what authority do you bear? And so he wants Moses to say, I am, has sent me to you. Now, one of the most beautiful parts in the New Testament is found in John chapter 8, verse 58, 54 through 58, where Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, and they want to know, what authority are you coming to us with? And Jesus says, look, before Abraham was, I am. He claims to be the God of the Old Testament. He claimed to bear not just the authority of a prophet, but God himself. And you know what the Jews did, the Pharisees did? They looked for rocks. They picked up rocks to stone him because he was claiming to be the God of the Old Testament. What are we supposed to tell people? We're supposed to speak about the one true God who exists, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true Lord. This is the person that we are to tell the people that we're surrounded with about. And so what are we supposed to say? Not just that God exists, but the Bible very clearly tells us in Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Look, sometimes we are so busy trying to find small talk and things that we should connect with people over that we fail to share the gospel, the good news. That's what gospel means. That's what we are supposed to share. Well, what is the gospel? Well, Paul puts it very simply in 1 Corinthians 15. Here's what he says. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, that which you received, by which you stand. This is what your life is all about. This is what you ought to share. He says, by this gospel, verse 2, you are saved if you hold fast to what I preach, mainly this, 
I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day according to the scriptures. What are we supposed to preach? The death burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, there needs to be some explanation to those things. We can't just walk up to say, hey, Jesus died for your sins, was buried in a tomb, and raised on the third day. Do you want to come to church with me? People probably look at you and be like, wow, this dude is really weird. So this was a succinct way of Paul putting the gospel formula that we need to share with people. Look, Jesus has died for you. He died for your sins. When I went to Jamaica and I shared the gospel with people in Jamaica, you know what one of the most prevailing thoughts was in Jamaica, and it may be for your friends and family as well, people in your community? I've got to become good enough before I can go to church. That I've got to get rid of the mess in my life, the sins that I've got, that I struggle with, before I'll decide to be baptized into Christ. Somehow I've got to clean myself up before I come to Jesus. When that's the exact opposite of the gospel. Jesus died for you while he saw you at your worst. He loved you while you were considered an enemy of God. He's already paid the price for your sins. You don't come to church and get good enough somehow before you come. You come to church and get saved by the grace of Jesus, and he will make you good enough. Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and he was buried. Jesus actually died. It was a real death. Islam has it wrong. He wasn't replaced supernaturally on the cross. He was pierced on the cross, and he died, and he was buried, but he resurrected There's truth in that. And if you look at the historical argument for the resurrection of Jesus, you can come with a very powerful proof that Jesus is God and he was who he claimed to be. Sharing the resurrection with people was one of the most important things that you can do. It's one of the greatest arguments for Christianity. In fact, it's the ultimate reason why I'm a Christian. When I started investigating religion, I came to the conclusion based off of certain arguments like the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the moral argument, there was without a shadow of a doubt, God exists. But which religion had it right? That was my question. And it wasn't until I really investigated the historical argument for the resurrection of Jesus that I came away with a confident certainty that Jesus resurrected from the dead. And that's based off of argumentation, logic, and historical evidence. What are we supposed to share with people? The gospel. Jesus has died for our sins. He really did resurrect from the dead. And it's not just some faith that's belief and absence of evidence. It's faith and belief because of evidence. That is the content of the gospel. Paul kind of put it like this earlier on in Corinthians. He says, look, I was determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ crucified. And look, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. I love to talk about the Cowboys with people. Just the other day at Fall Fest, I saw two little kids with Ohio State Buckeye jerseys uh, on. I'm a big Buckeye fan. I love the Ohio State Buckeyes. And we can use these things as conversation pieces. But ultimately, if we fail to share the gospel, we are no more than a humanitarian trying to do good for our world. We've missed the eternal perspective. God, what in the world am I going to say to these Hebrews? Tell them that I am has sent you. And that's the same truth for us. If you want to know what to share with people, read the Bible. Now we find something else. Look at Exodus chapter 4 verse 1. We're going to skip over a few passages of scripture. And then Moses said this, well look, okay, I'll share this with them, but what if they will not believe me? Or what if they won't listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you, dude, in a burning bush. Yeah, right, okay? I'm not believing it. What in the world am I going to do if they don't believe me? Have you ever had that fear of rejection? What if they don't want to come to church? What if they don't want to do a Bible study? What if they don't want to attend a small group? Well, what if they don't want to believe what I have to say? That's not your problem. God has called you to be faithful, not successful. God has called you to share the gospel And it's up to the free will choice of the individual that's hearing you whether or not they'll accept it or reject it. God, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of failing. You ever been afraid of failing before? And look what God responds to him with in verse 2. And the Lord said to him, what's that in your hand? And he said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. This would be Kind of (laughs) weird. I mean, a staff was a shepherd's staff, and he would use this to guide his sheep, protect them. It was also a defensive weapon. So say a wolf were to come up to, you know, the flock, he would beat the wolf, sometimes to death, um, and try to to get the wolf around. And so he has this shepherd's staff. He says, throw it on the ground. Look what happens. And so he threw it on the ground, 
and it became a serpent. And this is so funny. And Moses fled from it. The guy sees fire, a burning bush, and he's like, ooh, fire, let me go see what this is. And then rightfully, any correct, moral, sane man of God sees a snake and he's going to run. I do not understand people who are attracted to snakes. I mean, they're awful. Ooh, they're disgusting. They're scary. They have poison in their teeth. I mean, who likes to play with snakes? You're crazy to me, okay? We cannot be friends. I'm just going to tell you that right now. If you've got snakes in your house, not coming over. I don't care what you offer me. Not going to happen. We'll got the Panera Bread or something like that. But here's Moses, throws this staff on the ground, and it becomes a snake. What is God doing for Moses? He's giving him evidence. He's giving him a miraculous proof to confirm what he is saying is true. Now, look, God doesn't do this kind of stuff for us today. God gives us the historical proof based on scriptures used with logic about the resurrection of Jesus, right? God has given us a lot of evidence, a lot of proofs, to prove that Christianity is true beyond a reasonable doubt. But Moses gets a little something extra. He didn't have a Bible. And so he says, look, I'm going to do something miraculous. Throws the stick on the ground. It becomes a snake. He runs from it as any man of God would. And look what happens. It says, but the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. And so he stretched it out, uh, his hand, and he caught it. Look, the only person that's going to convince me to grab a snake is going to be the Lord, okay? And so he catches it by the tail And it says, it became a staff in his hand. And so God does this miraculous thing. A staff becomes a snake. He grabs it by the tail, and it becomes a staff again. Now, the Egyptians were able to do magic, not miracles. And so they were able to take a snake and make it stiff through their magic and incantation. But not Moses. Moses gets something miraculous. And it was a proof to the people that he was speaking for God. And look what also happens. It says in verse 6, the Lord furthermore said to him, now put your hand into your bosom. That was basically, okay, it's not his butt. It's just his way of sticking his hand down into his garment. And it says, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. So he puts it in and he pulls it out, and it's this rotten hand that is totally decayed. That would kind of scare me. Would it scare you? I'd be like, ah! <laughs> you know what I mean? Sorry if I scared you last week with my story. I know, I kind of went a little overboard with the, uh, with the fire thing, so I just want to apologize. I saw some people do this. <laughs> That was my fault, okay, my bad. Uh, But uh, the fire did scare me, so we're kind of like even, because you felt what I felt. Uh, If you want to see or hear that story, you have to go online and watch the sermon. But he sticks his hand in his garment, he pulls it out, his hand's white as snow, he sticks it back in, he pulls it out again, and it's restored. And look at verse 8. If they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. Because guess what? Leprosy was incurable. Only somebody that was on God's side, could possibly have their hand cured of leprosy. And then something else takes place. So God gives him two proofs, and then finally a third. Exodus chapter 4 verse 9 says, But if they will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water in which you take from the Nile will become blood on dry ground. Literal, actual blood. It's kind of creepy. But this was God's way of giving evidence to Moses and the people of Israel that Moses was who he said he was. And look, God has given us stuff. The cosmological argument based on science and logic and reasoning is one of the most powerful arguments that you have to convince people that God exists. Look, the material universe didn't just pop into existence out of nothing. God spoke it into existence. The moral argument the teleological argument. There are things out there that you have access to that can persuade people that God exists, Jesus resurrected from the dead, and Christianity is true, just like God gave proof to Moses. Well, what about this? Well, Moses says, okay, look, this isn't working. God's not getting the hint. I've tried two excuses to get out of this, and he's still pressuring me to go. So uh, how about this? I, 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 can't, I, I can't speak. I'm slow of tongue. There's a preacher at the last church that I was at. Sometimes, every once in a while, he would get into a stuttering uh, problem. And uh, there's a, a city in the Bible called Shittim. And so he stuttered his way through that. And I could not stop laughing in service. <laughs> you ever have one of those moments where you get the giggles and you can't stop laughing? Because he stuttered his way through that one, and it was great. Well, here's Moses. He's like, look, I, I, I can't really speak very well. And maybe legitimately, not to poke fun at people, you know, that's not what we're trying to do, but maybe legitimately you're like, look, I'm really not eloquent of speech. 
I can't get up and preach, you know, I struggle kind of putting words together. And Moses, he's got a stuttering problem. Look what it says in verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, uh, please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently or in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Look, man, it takes me a while to get the message out. I speak really fast, in case you haven't noticed. And can you imagine if I were to stand up here and I were to preach the message like this? Half of you would be gone. Just admit it. Just admit it. You're like, I'm not listening to a guy like that, okay? It's not going to happen. Nothing against Rick, just not going to happen. Well, here's Moses. He's like, look, God, I don't know if it'll take another 400 years in order to get out of Egypt. I actually find this stuff funny. I'm surprised that you don't. Some of you are like staring me down like, come on, get on with this. So it says in verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, who has made man's mouth or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? In other words, look, Moses, I'm in control. Don't use your physical deformity as a way of getting out of what I've commissioned you to do. In fact, I can use it. I can provide a way through it. I'm in control here. In verse 12, it says this, now then go. And even I, I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you're here to say. But he said, please, please, God, just send somebody else. Please just send somebody else. I don't want to go. That's what he's saying. And you know what God does? He doesn't let Moses off the hook. He sends him out. He's going to have a reunion with his brother, Aaron. It says in verse 14, then finally God says, look, all right, I've had enough. You ever reach that breaking point, parents, with your kids? Listen to what I have to say. Now you're getting a spank in or you're getting in timeout or whatever it is. All right, now I'm angry. All right, this is going down. And so in verse 14, it says, The anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, Is not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. Moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put words in his mouth. Teach him. Teach him what to preach. Look, Aaron was the preacher, not Moses. Moses was the teacher. He was the inspired prophet. And it says, and even I, I will be with you, with your mouth and his mouth. I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. I am so encouraged by this. You know why? That means God can take me, that a mess sometimes, a mess of a person, and he can use somebody like me. He really can. Look, you may not be the preacher. You may not even be the teacher, but God will find a way to use you for his glory. You just have to be willing. God says, look, Moses, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to give you your brother Aaron, and he's going to preach for you, but I still want you to go. Look, we could come up with so many reasons as why we shouldn't share the gospel with people. We could be a part of that 47% that thinks it's even wrong. God wants you to share the gospel. He wants you to overcome your fears. He wants you to get rid of your excuses. And he wants you to be a courageous person with solid moral character of deep conviction that is sent on a commission to share the good news with the people around you. Don't waste your life. Look what Paul said in 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, look, church at Corinth, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. For I came to you in weakness and in fear. You ever been afraid to share the gospel? I have, and with much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith would not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Look, God wanted to make it crystal clear for the people of Israel. God is at work. And if he can take somebody like Moses and somebody like Paul and you look at their life and the life that they lived, God was at work in their life. God wants to take you and he wants people to know that it is he who is at work in your life. And so maybe you don't know the arguments that I stated earlier. Maybe you don't know everything there is to know about the resurrection, but here's what you can say. Look at what God has done with me and my life and he can do it with you as well. Look, I'm a mess and God loves me and uses me. You're a mess. God will love you and use you as well well. Sometimes one of the greatest things that you can do is share a personal testimony with the people around you. God is at work. He is on the move. He wants to use you. And so if your neighbor says no to come to church, ask him again. 
If your friend at work says no to come to church or a Bible study or small group, ask them again. Keep going to them. Keep sharing. Keep being the message that God wants you to be to the people around you. And so here I have a picture of the live look at Moses at this point where God has finally told him to go. And here's Moses. Please, God, send somebody else. And maybe you're there too. You know what the real issue was with Moses? He didn't want to. I don't really have a secret formula for helping you get over your lack of desire to share the gospel. That's up to you. That's only your decision. But it's part of God's plan for your life. God doesn't just want you to be a good person. God wants you to be a great teacher, a great preacher, a great sharer of the gospel. And so maybe it's with our students. Maybe it's loving on babies. Maybe it's teaching toddlers. Maybe it's getting involved in the pre-K or the K through five or the teenagers. Or maybe it's getting plugged in at a group and supporting people in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it's saying come and see rather than go and tell. I don't know how to help you overcome your lack of desire to share the gospel, but I know it's something that we need to do. And I know it's something that we need to pray about. And I know it's something that God wants us to do, just like Moses. And so we know the rest of Moses' story. He went and he shared to Pharaoh And they had plagues, and it was a complete disaster for Egypt. And Moses led the people of Israel up out of Egypt into the promised land. And that's the big picture of this whole thing. Courageous faith is not about making you a greater person. Courageous faith is about leading people to Jesus. Let's stand.